Sex is a big deal. Everywhere you look, the music industry, movies, TV, advertising. A teacher was giving a uh, lecture on male adolescence and she said, according to the latest research, the atypical teenage uh, uh, boy has a sexual related thought once every 17 seconds. Then the bell rang and kids were going out and one boy said to another, wow, once every 17 seconds, that's hard to believe. And the other one looked back at him and he said, yeah, what do you think about the other 16 seconds? <laughs> so today in our uh, series of messages, the original top 10, uh, the 10 commandments seen through New Testament eyes, we come to, you shall not commit adultery. Why does God forbid us from committing adultery? The common assumption is, well, God's a killjoy. He doesn't have any fun. He doesn't want us to have any fun either. And he just wants to give us a bunch of rules and keep us in line. But wait. God made sex. Why did he make it so enjoyable? Because it's a good thing. You want proof? Uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs 5.19, talking about a husband to his wife, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. You say, I never saw that when I was growing up in catechism or Sunday school. You know, if you ever think about memorizing verses from the Bible, this would be a good place to start. May her breast satisfy, you know. So why did God put restrictions on sex? Why did he limit sexual activity to marriage? Maybe God puts restrictions on sex because it's a good thing. He wants to protect it. And he wants to protect marriage. I can think of three important reasons God put restrictions on protection on sex. One, adultery is a sin against God. Every time we violate this commandment, we sin against God. Joseph was a slave in Egypt uh, and served a gentleman named Potiphar. Potiphar traveled a lot, and uh, when he went out of town, he put his business and his household in the care of Joseph. Potiphar's wife uh, was constantly trying to seduce Joseph, but he always resisted her. Well, one time Potiphar was out of town, and And uh, she got Joseph in a compromising position in her bedroom. She said, sleep with me. And this is how he answered. Your husband has committed everything into my care. He entrusted it all to me. How could I abuse that trust? Then he goes a step further. How can I abuse that trust and sin against who? God. He said it wouldn't be just a sin against Potiphar. It'd be a sin against God. When David was convicted of sin with adultery with Bathsheba, he cried to God, against you, you only, have I sinned. Speaking of sexual immorality, the Apostle Paul writes, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but whom? God. Adultery is a sin against God. But you say, that still doesn't answer the question. Why does God put restrictions on sex? Well, two, adultery destroys marriage. Now, one way some people see sex today is as a natural appetite. They say there used to be all kinds of taboos around uh, sex, but now today we recognize it's just a normal uh, appetite. You know, like eating. And... uh, you know, if, 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 if you have a need, you, you just satisfy the need. And you might as well try a variety of cuisines and t- t- test out new taste t- sensations. Forbidding the satisfaction of an appetite is unhealthy. But maybe God knows something more than we do. He knows that nothing tears at the fabric of marriage faster than adultery. At a marriage ceremony, the bride and groom are each to ask, will you love, honor, and cherish each other and forsaking all others, keep yourself only 
for your mate as long as you both shall live? And the answer needs to be, I will. If, neither, if either bride or groom does not answer, we don't have a marriage. Against that backdrop, a married person has to understand that he or she has made a solemn covenant before God to be faithful. So then we can see why adultery is such a serious offense. It is a violation of an oath we made to God and it violates our mate. It's not just the adulterous sexual relationship that's so destructive, it's also the accompanying deceit and dishonesty. How could you deceive me like that? How could you lie to me? Why would you mock my trust? Not only does adultery destroy a marriage, but it rips apart the family. And as the family comes apart, the whole society comes apart at the seams. You look at the population in prison, 70% of those in prison for murder or rape come from fatherless homes. God puts restrictions on sex because it's a good thing. And he wants to protect it and protect marriage. Three, adultery diminishes love. Mark Regeneres and Jeremy Ecker uh, write a book, Premarital Sex in America, How Young Americans Meet, Mate, and Think About Marrying. In the last chapter, they share 10 myths about sex and relationships. Let me just uh, read you a couple of them. The introduction of sex is necessary to sustain a fledgling or struggling relationship. Uh, they show, quite to the contrary, the sooner a relationship becomes sexual, the more likely it is to end in a breakup. Another one, porn won't affect your relationships. They show that porn affects all relationships. Studies show that men who, who get involved in pornography have a diminished desire for real relationships. So it shrinks the marriage pool. Another one is sex need not mean anything. I mean, this is just the point I'm making. Uh, sex can be separated from love and not involve love at all. Moving in together is definitely a step toward marriage. They show quite, uh, quite the opposite, that uh, moving in together statistically does not lead to marriage. And if it does lead to marriage, it, it leads to an increased likelihood of ending in divorce. Adultery and sexual activity too soon does not lead to love. People tell us they engage in affairs because they love each other. I, I think no one would deny that they, they experience affection, uh, love, uh, uh, friendship love, and erotic love. But I doubt they reach God's unconditional love. God's unconditional love asks, what, you know, I care mostly about you and your well-being. How can you claim to be considering another person's welfare when you're tearing apart their well-being and destroying their marriage or their relationship with their kids? Or if you're married, your marriage and your kids. God puts restrictions on sex because it's a good thing. And he wants to protect it and protect marriage. He wants us to experience real love. So how can we avoid adultery? Adultery and keep the seventh commandment. A number of years ago, a, a number of scholars came together to decide to write a new study Bible. It's called the Net Bible. Uh, it's one-fourth text and three-fourths notes. So you read a verse and you can look down and there's all these comments about what the verse means. It's a massive book, here it is. You know, some people kind of use it for, for curls. You know, and uh, <clears throat> so they're working on a deadline to, to get this into the publisher. And uh, one of the guys uh, gets a call from his credit card company. And he says, you know, I'm kind of busy here. Can I, can I call you back? And they said, sure. He says, well, what's your number? And so he types it in uh, where he's working, figures he can delete it later. It's a true story. And uh, 
uh, he, he, he types it in and he's working on this verse and of course uh, it, it gets published with this 1-800 number in, in, the, in the first net Bible that gets, so you gotta look at what he was working on. He was working on Proverbs 2, 16. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words. And then there's this 1-800 number. <laughs> Can you imagine how many calls the credit card company got, you know? Hey, can you help me with this problem? <clears throat> how about the publisher that does the final editing work and he's reading through it and just leaves the 1-800 number in there? Isn't that classic? Jesus helps us. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now, Jesus does this with all the Ten Commandments. He raises the bar. You think maybe, I think I got this one. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What does Jesus mean? He doesn't mean for us to gouge out our eye or cut off our hand. Some people have taken him too literally and actually harmed themselves. Nor does Jesus teach that uh, you commit adultery if you look at a person of the opposite sex. I mean, come on, that can hardly be helped. What he forbids is that second look, that look with desire. So if Jesus uh, condemns that second look, the key is to get a long first look. <laughs> right? Christ meant that the best way to avoid adultery is to discipline ourselves. We live as if we don't have eyes to look, as we don't have hands to touch. We can't obey this commandment if we allow our minds to feast on porn or movies that, that, that depict that adultery is no big deal. We avoid adultery by guarding our hearts, our minds, our eyes, and our hands. Because sex is a good thing, and God wants to protect it and protect marriage. Now, there's more to this commandment than avoiding adultery. The seventh commandment must also be understood positively. Eight of the Ten Commandments are stated in the negative. They're so negative, we don't much like them. But behind each commandment is a grand positive. The seventh commandment does more than set boundaries on marriage. You get to heaven someday and you say, well, I was married and I was never unfaithful. Expecting a pat on the back and Jesus will say, fine. But did you cultivate a strong marriage? That's the grand positive. So what does it take to build a strong marriage? A 40-year-old guy asked his pastor to baptize him and the pastor said, why do you want me to baptize you? He says, because I don't want to suck anymore. I mean, he expresses the, dis, the, the cry of many men across America. We know that we suck and we don't want to suck anymore. I mean, I'd say many men would say, you know, most of the domains in my life are going pretty well. I feel like I'm doing pretty well at work. Got the job thing going, okay, I feel pretty good physically. I work out, I think I'm in pretty good shape. My fantasy football team took second place last year. So far the kids haven't died on my watch. But my marriage, I'm not a very good husband. So what does it take to cultivate a strong marriage? Let me give you two suggestions. First, marriage requires work. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a letter to his cousin. She was marrying his best friend. And he wrote this letter to her from prison because he spoke out against the Nazi regime and so he spent the, the war in prison. So it's, his advice is found in a, a book called Letters and Papers from Prison. And in it there's this wonderful little letter and he says to his cousin, you must not 
make, uh, uh, see your marriage, uh, first of all, as religious. You must, first of all, see it as secular. What does he mean by that? He says you, you shouldn't take your marriage and too quickly speak about the blessing of God. You're the one that decides to get married. You're the one that has to make it work. Marriages aren't made in heaven. You get married. What's made in heaven is the desire, God's desire for men and women to find companionship, to be monogamous, to be pure and chaste, learn to be loving and kind. But you get to pick your wife. You get to pick your husband. Your marriage is secular first. You have to make it go. And what does it take to make it go? You have to work at it. It takes a massive amount of energy. In practically all cases, adultery happens to people who have gone dead in their marriages. They've stopped working at it. Dorothy Sayers writes a, a great book called Christian Letters in a Post-Christian Age. She says we live in a post-Christian age. doesn't mean there aren't Christians in the United States. There are lots of them. But it's no longer the baseline of our culture. It's not the, the thing play, where people start in public discourse and assumption. She takes the, ten, the seven deadly sins and divides them into hot and cold sins. And when she gets to adultery, she calls it a cold sin. Sexual activity between unmarried people she calls a hot sin. <clears throat> but adultery she calls a cold sin. It happens to stale people. It doesn't happen to people who are energetically working on their marriage, dating each other and thinking about how they can grow in their relationship. It happens to people who are worn out. It happens to people who have stopped working on their relationship. They feel beaten down. They feel unappreciated, uncared for. Then they meet somebody else who compliments them and makes them feel wonderful and uh, cared for and important, and they start a mature relationship down a slippery slope to disaster. If you suffer from a poor physical relationship in your marriage, more than likely it indicates poor communication patterns, lack of sensitivity, lack of warmth. If that describes your marriage, don't leave it that way. You're putting your mate and yourself in grave peril. Apostle Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 7 that husbands and wives are to meet each other's needs sexually. It's vital that we meet our partner's needs so well that they have no interest in looking elsewhere. A healthy physical relationship more than likely indicates good uh, talking and uh, warmth and mutual support. How do you get to that point? How do you keep your marriage alive? You have to put energy into it. You have to work at it. Now you can better understand what our Lord means when he says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, don't let your eyes wander. Don't look on the other side of the fence. If you want to make your marriage go, concentrate with all your energy on your partner. And if you're the other person in an adulterous relationship, you're not innocent. You're a spoiler. You're diverting your friend's attention from their own marriage, and they don't have any energy to spare. Marriage requires work. Who does the work? You do. God puts restrictions on sex because it's a good thing. He wants to protect it. He wants to protect marriage. There's a second essential for, growing, for a growing marriage. Marriage requires grace. Grace is what sets Christian marriages apart from all other marriages. In the Christian sacrament of matrimony, uh, the ring symbolizes God's blessing on a marriage. The maid of honor and the 
best man, give the rings to the priest or the pastor, and then he uh, prays for them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Christian couples do not enter their marriages alone, but they have the promise that Christ is there with them. It's His grace that enables us to forgive, to reconcile, to keep going when things go wrong. And things always go wrong in a marriage. I mean, we're human beings. What would you expect? We make mistakes. And when the marriage is facing a crisis, when things are afraid, that's not the time to break up a marriage. That's the time when we need God's grace to heal us, to help us to forgive. That's when we need God's grace to help us uh, fulfill Paul's instructions. Get rid of all bitterness. If there's bitterness in your marriage, rage, anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice, get rid of it. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God's grace takes an enormous load off of us. We realize we don't have to do it all ourselves. We have Christ to lean on. We don't have to be perfect. We know we're going to make mistakes. And His grace can forgive us and give us a new start. You don't have to beat yourself over the head the rest of your life for something you did. You know the story of the woman caught in adultery? Religious leaders bring her to Jesus and they say, here, Moses declares she should be stoned to death. What do you think? And Jesus says, let the one among you who's never sinned throw the first rock. They think about it and one by one they shuffle off. Then Jesus kneels down next to the woman. He says, where are your accusers? Does anybody condemn you? She says, no one, sir. He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You may have blown it in your marriage. You may have committed adultery. You may have gotten involved in porn. But God forgives you. Your mate may have done some terrible things to hurt you. But God forgives them. And you need to too. You can't go back and undo your past, but God's forgiveness can give you a fresh start. God's grace provides us with the ability to forgive our mates, forgive ourselves. Gives us the power to go on. Following Jesus means saying, Jesus, I can't do this without you. I need you in my life. You'll never make it in your marriage on your strength alone. You'll never fulfill the Ten Commandments on your own ability. Can't be done. But if you admit your weakness and invite Jesus Christ into your life, you will discover His grace. Have you discovered Jesus Christ? Following Jesus means admitting in your own strength you will fail. Have you finally come to the end of trusting in yourself? Have you discovered that life goes best when you depend on the power of Jesus Christ? Christ is the only one that can help you keep this seventh commandment. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for this commandment. We don't much like it. Seems pretty confining. And Lord Jesus, you raised the bar and made it even harder. We don't like that either. But yeah, we see today that you give us this instruction for our best good. So we thank you for it. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to God. I think it's important when we hear from His Word that we respond to Him. So just each one of you, silently, head bowed.
Would you say something to God, something to Jesus right now? Maybe it's you realize that you need to make some changes in your life. Maybe you're married and you realize you need to work on your marriage and put energy into it. You're not. Or maybe you realize, you know, you've got some practices in your life that are really not for your best good and not good and you want to confess that to Him and make a whole new commitment. Maybe you want to invite Christ into your life. You're not sure you've ever done that before. You say, I need you in my life. I can't do this without you. I want to make you my Lord. You, would you pray? I'd like to just give you a minute. Lord God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you're not a killjoy. You made life great. And you love us and you want us to enjoy it to the fullest. And that's why you give us its instructions. Help us to believe that and depend on you and invite you into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.